Hey guys, welcome to the journal. My name is Sam Pierce, and I'm here with my good co-host and good friend, Mike Kotrowski. We have a great show for you today, filled with great documentaries for you to enjoy, so don't go anywhere. <laughs> Royal Flush. <laughs> uh, I thought we were playing Go Fish. You are a moron. Well, luckily the people in our first doc are better poker players than Mike here. Our first doc of the day is called Crowd Staker by our very own Daryl Reyes. Check it out here on the journal. Hi, I'm Ian and I have two passions, filmmaking and poker. And I'm here at WPT Niagara Falls, combining my two passions by shooting a poker documentary where the hero of the film is playing for his audience. Last year I started an Indiegogo campaign to raise 10 grand to make this film with me as a subject and I was only able to raise 6k in a few days. It wasn't enough to make a film so I took the funds and I played in smaller events in the WSOP and my backers were able to follow, follow me every day on my blog, crowdstaker.com. I didn't win, but I learned a lot from the experience. Number one, Vegas is too good for me. And number two, the idea of crowdfunding a documentary film about poker where the hero plays for his audience is something that people want to be a part of. So I'm going to relaunch the campaign this year, but this time the hero is going to be a poker pro. Slowing down, not good. We've got like 17 minutes until the tournament starts. We're definitely gonna be a little late. Well, that's okay. No big deal, almost half a level one. So now there's a, we got drama already. Yeah, we got a drama, we're stuck in traffic. So 17 tension. minutes, right? Yeah, 17 minutes oh, until tournament starts. And like just finding parking and getting to the tournament room is like a 10 minute endeavor anyway. So we basically got to be rolling up to that parking garage in seven minutes to make it on time, and I don't think that's going to happen. There's lots of spots here, though. Alrighty. Yeah, I don't like that spot, so let's go this one. Back wall, why not? Yeah, pretty excited. I haven't played poker in a while, so it's pretty good. I think so, yeah. Okay. I don't know how much you guys are going to be able to get today. That sucks. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm just going to sit beside here until... Uh, I'll, I'll see how far as we can go. Um, we're on dinner break right now. We've got an hour to relax. I am super exhausted, so I'm thinking I'm going to go to my car and lie down for a bit and just grab a sandwich on the way back or something. I don't know. Um, not super hungry. Been snacking all day. But yeah, I got a good stack, around 38,000, above average, but that doesn't really mean anything. We're coming back to like 38 big blinds exactly. So, you know, we're we're comfortable, but not like super comfortable. Like we're gonna have to chip up still, but it's not like we can just fold our way to day two or anything, but we're in good shape. All right, well, that's how she goes sometimes. Uh, didn't make day two, but I don't know, I think we played good. We finished in like the top 30th percentile, so like, you know, not too shabby, even though that pays zero dollars, but like, whatever, that's just how she goes sometimes, you know? All right, let's go home. I'm Brad Tuck, and uh, this is... Ian Tawasi. Ian. Um, so why don't you tell us a little bit about uh, what we're doing here? So we're making a movie. It's, what? A, do it's a documentary. Okay. So, so we're making a documentary about you returning to the World Series of Poker when you pledge to this project. 
you're you're helping to fund the production of a documentary, and you're also going to get a reward just like in any other Kickstarter and Google project. But instead of a T-shirt or, or some a, stickers or like signed yeah. pictures of me, which I have lots of signed pictures of me. If yeah. anyone wants one, just send me an email. All right. Yeah. Right. So, <laughs> so instead of that, we're we're giving them my or well a percentage of a my percent possible. Of like, Cashing the main event's not like a guaranteed exactly. thing, but like, you know, we're getting, you're getting, we're the farther I go, the more our audience is going to be. Right, right. It's going to be a really boring documentary if I like bust first hand on day one, but right. that could happen. And that's, and I think that's what's exciting. I, that is, yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a bit shopping. of a gamble whether or not this movie's even going to be a movie. You right, know? exactly. And then it'll just be a short doc. I'm hoping we can flush this thing out into yeah. a real nice looking movie. But, yeah, yeah. That, that's the goal. Let's do it. Let's make a movie. Yeah. Right. I think we're done. Yeah. You know, Sam, there's something therapeutic about painting. You're absolutely right, Mike. It's just so relaxing and peaceful, it makes me want to talk about my feelings. And those feelings and are- And it's time for our next doc. We're gonna take a look at some actual art therapy with a professional. This is Art Therapy by Heather Beresford. Hey, Mike, what's your spirit animal? We come together to teach each other how to be alone. Because the thing is, you know, we live in a, um, society that's, you know, we're surrounded by people, we're um, constantly stimulated by things, but at the end of the day, you know, many of us still have that kind of alone feeling um, and all the things that come along with that. The thing about with art therapy is a lot of people, you know, say, oh, you know, I would be bad at that or I am not an artist or I can only draw a stick man or I, I you know, I, I am not very creative. And everybody is creative whether or not that thought might have got damaged somewhere along the line where someone said, oh, you can't sing, or, oh, that's a horrible drawing, or, you know, you have no rhythm, or whatever. Somewhere along that, that process of play within their life, that might have got interrupted and then stunted. So I think the great thing about art therapy is that it lets somebody come at arts again from a non-judgmental, playful way. People seek art therapy for my gosh, probably infinite reasons. Um, you know, it could be for stress management, it could be for grief and loss, it could be for anxiety and depression, um, it could be for isolation. For example, if somebody isn't so great with talk, it's, it's starting to involve the whole body within the process um, of how people express themselves. So rather than just, um, as a therapist, rather than just taking specific note on what people are saying, I'm paying attention to you know, their whole body. They might want to pick something that works for them, or I might kind of see a certain activity that, that I believe might be helpful uh, for them with whatever issue that they're bringing. When I did my degree in visual arts, it was very much about when you did your artwork, you had to explain why, 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 why. There had to be kind of reasons behind. You couldn't just stick something up. And even when people did critiques, they had to, you couldn't just say you liked something or you didn't like something, you had to explain why. But it was really interesting when I switched from doing that, that whole critique process um, in the visual arts degree and then went into doing expressive arts therapy and then it became about the process and not the finished piece and um, it became about the art in the room as its own element rather than the artist as the know-all thing. You have the client and you have the therapist but what I also really like about expressive arts therapy is that it takes a lot of the power, you know, the power dynamic away from the therapist, you know, as the kind of knowing thing or, you know, the person with all the answers because it's about bringing the third element into the room, which is the arts. For the therapist, like for me, I have to be very aware of that because when I kind of try to start controlling the situation or anything like that, it can block that experience. And that experience between the client and the arts is the most important experience, I think. For me personally, and I'm sure for a lot of people who practice in the therapy counseling world, it's important that people know what their own issues are before they work with others. Um, even for me, as somebody in recovery, like a recovering alcoholic and addict, um, and also as someone who's gone through a lot of loss as well like I mean I lost my father when I was a little girl so I have to know when a client comes into the room 
you know, for example, if a little girl comes in to my office and she's just lost a parent, I have to be really aware, um, you know, of what's mine and what's hers. So any, like, you know, counter-transference and transference that I'm not, you know, projecting my life and my experiences onto her and to allow her process to happen because um, it's, that is, it's her process. Untangling the messages that got um, given to somebody or that they perceived, uh, you know, and stop them in the creative process to try to kind of open that up again. And now it's time for our live musical performance of the show. Patrick Hamilton, Hamilton and, and Lil, Lil Fuckus. And that was a musical performance by Patrick Hamilton and Little Fuckus. What did you think of that, Mike? I thought it was great. And speaking of music, what we have next is Fleming. Mr. Fleming has a documentary, and it's all about the production of music. Let's take a look. school samples, 808s and stuff like that. I like to use this Casio I've got right here too. It's really actually quite useful for, for like all those weird cheesy, like, you know, the cheesiest sort of sense that you've ever heard. But trying to give them new light by passing them through new uh, effects processors, you know, give them some sort of fresh. I don't even come close to making a living off music. Not yet, you know. It's something that I think almost every single bedroom producer or 
anybody really who makes music aspires to do. You know, they really want to have a place where they can put their music and people are really going to care about it at the same time, you know. Which, it doesn't happen very often. It really doesn't. Uh, usually, when you play a show, um, it depends on the kind of person you're doing it with. If you're doing it with a guy who's who's been around for a while and he's trying to he's trying he's you know a promoter you know or whatever, you, you know you might make nothing. You really might. Um, he might be trying to take all your money. It depends on whether there's an artist who's running the show. Artist run shows are usually a lot better. It's a lot more compassion. You know, everyone wants to see someone go home with something in their pocket. You know, whereas people who are just completely doing it for the sake of like you know money of course they want to see themselves go home with money in their own pocket you know which is fair it's what they do their job is to see themselves get paid people who have spent their whole lives you know trying to make money even after going through a rigorous education program musically based and they come out with no job because there's not it's, it's the arts you know in the arts there aren't stable jobs you're lucky if you get a connection the best connection you can get is Again, like producing for a, a singer or getting your music licensed or starting a music production company or something like that where you, you start putting together um, whatever. You start making sounds and backtracks for stuff and you send them out and you hope that somebody notices them or that Sony's interested and if you're lucky you'll get some of your stuff. Shall I compare B to a cold winter night? What am I doing? Does that not like it's my son? No, please. Seven Keep going. You suck it. Let's check out our next doc produced by Kevin Thompson about a local playwright here in Toronto. The hell? Playwright, director, and artistic director. The first time I remember really writing a script was in high school. I uh, wrote this scene from a book. We had to write a, like a live action interview scene. And uh, I remember writing the scene and acting out in front of my class, and I looked to the back of the room, and my English teacher was crying. And I knew at that moment that, wow, I really like this. I like the feeling of writing characters and stuff like that, and making people have feelings towards them and such. The first play I ever wrote was called uh, The World is a Dance, and it was about a young boy who uh, has a, his father and his dance teacher, both male, and he's dealing with the crisis kind of, 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 of his identity and who he's going to be. and and the two other people, or two other people, worrying about who they're going to be as well to him. Uh, that's the first play I ever wrote. It was just like a one actor playing all the parts type of thing. A lot of things inspired me, right? Um, but it's never things that are really grandiose. Um, I, I'll just give you an example. So a few years ago, I was I went to visit um, the summer home of Theodore Roosevelt. And I'm on this tour, and if you ever, if you see pictures of my room, you'll know how much Theodore Roosevelt stuff I have in my room. I've got like three shelves of books on him. I'm very knowledgeable about him. I know more than most Americans. <laughs> and I was writing this, I was, I was at, at the site, and through the tour, it became very apparent to me that one of the sons of him was not being talked about. And just that little tiny moment of real, realization made me write a whole play about the last days of, of Theodore Roosevelt's son, Kermit Roosevelt. And so it can be something really small like that. Usually what I find what's inspiring for me is finding a story that not a lot of people know or are even remotely aware of. And that really sparks me because I love to be able to tell people about stuff like that. The next play I wrote was actually more um, involved. Uh, it's actually about three fathers and three sons who go on a camping trip together. And it was the one that really sparked me because um, I took a long time to go through the process of writing it. And I wrote it with the idea of father-son relationships, which I was kind of dealing with at the time. And so that play was the one that really got me uh, motivated to keep writing and to keep going with it. Uh, it was it was simply called Fathers and Sons, and it was just a very cathartic experience writing that type of play. Write what you love. Don't worry whether whether or not it's sellable. It's something if if you can write it well enough and have a passion for it, uh, it will be able to be sold. Someone will like it. Someone will find a place for it. Uh, the other thing I usually tell young writers is, is simplify. A lot of times a lot of writers want to write these larger than life stories and often it's the small stories at a much smaller human scale that are more important and often kind of enlighten people. So usually um, with myself I'm really bad at having plays grow bigger than they're supposed to be but it's often going back to the, 
the grassroots of the, pro of the project and why you love this project. And that's really what I tell writers to do, is just to go back to the, what's the real reason you want to write this and watch the size and remember that it's the simple stories that really matter in the end. 100, 100 and one. Yep, feeling the burn. Yeah, nothing like pumping some iron to get the old blood flowing. I can just feel myself being transformed into a chiseled piece of raw animal. Yeah, time for another talk. Sit back and enjoy your final <sighs> film of the day. It's called The Art of Fitness. My name is Everest Fabro. Positions Campus Recreation and Facility Coordinator of the Story Arts Fitness Center. The attendance in the first semester for the two months wasn't too much because we still had Frog Gym. So I maybe got maybe like almost 200 for two months, giving get because our hours were kind of 10 to 4, so it was a little less than it is now. Right now, because we opened our hours of operation from 8.30 to 6.30, so we've had a lot more students come out and a lot more people know about the facility. A lot of people like it because especially in the winter time, if they have an hour break, they don't want to go all the way there in the cold and snowing just to work out for an hour. So a lot of the times people come in for like 30 minutes to 45 minutes, get a good pump, get a good sweat on, and then they just go right back to class right after. Christian Roxas, Centennial College. I work out about four times, four or five times a week. Pros, it's very convenient. Um, it's, it's very accessible. We have everything that we could need to work out. The main problem I see with the gym is that I don't see uh, there being an ability to improve on it much because it just doesn't, we don't have the space. This is all we have for the gym. We can't really fit the equipment that I personally, and I think also a lot of people who are more interested in hypertrophy and strength training would need. Um, cons, weekend hours. Some people can't make it on weekends. I mean, sorry, during the weekdays, but can on weekends, so. I thought it was kind of ridiculous that they considered doing anything less than 7 a.m. to 9 p.m. on weekdays, uh, and that they should have weekend hours. I have seen improvements in the hours, but they're still not where I would like them to be. I think they could be there if they considered hiring more students. Maybe a squat rack? But you can make do, definitely make do with the, with the, the dumbbells we have here, uh, for sure. But um, a power rack would be cool. Some of the concerns were lack of equipment, but because of the lack of the size of the school and lack of the population, this is the facility that they that was offered towards me. For the hours of operation, people wanted it open earlier, but between 8.30 and 11.30, I'm not getting too many. So we're gonna adjust the hours a little bit because it looks like more people are coming at the end of the day compared to that at the beginning. And for hours of operation, it's uh, the washrooms because we have two showers and then two washrooms. One's designated to a female, the other one's unisex. So if I have a bunch of uh, a bunch of males come and use the gym, and then they all want to leave at the same time, they'd have to take turns with that one washroom because they can't use the female one only. It used to be two unisex, but then we did a, we did a survey, and then we were talking to the executives of uh, Centennial, and they wanted one designated just the females, just for like a safety hazard. Uh, they didn't like people playing ping pong while people were working out. So it was a trial and error first semester, so the second semester, if someone's using the gym, no one's allowed to play ping pong. So we designated, a, we have a ping pong club now, it's 5.30 to 6.30 every Tuesdays, and that's when they're allowed to play ping pong without any dis uh, disruptions from anyone else. People could come in for five minutes to 10 minutes, or say for the whole 25 minutes and meditate just to get uh, away from school, away from all the stress. And then we have yoga twice a week, and then we have a Zumba and a boot camp. I feel like some of the classes that they had at this gym, specifically the yoga one, have gotten in the way of my workouts sometimes, specifically because, for example, on Wednesday, Wednesdays, I have classes 9.30 to 7.20, like I said earlier, um, and there's only one hour short windows that I can work out in, but one of those yoga classes happens to be right in the middle of it, so if I need to go then, if I have to do anything between my other classes, I just can't go for that day at all. It's not possible, so that's a bit of an inconvenience. Some of the students now still don't know about the uh, fitness center because it's at a separate part of the school. I would like more marketing, uh, not so much posters, more something along with the TV monitors or just getting it broadcast throughout My Centennial emails. And there's something on the My Centennial page or East Centennial page as soon as they clock in at least for like a week or so just so people will know about it. I haven't heard anything negative uh, other than maybe hours could be extended. Okay. And um, 
positive that we have it, and students can use it, and staff can use it just by showing their cards. They don't pay anything extra for it. You know, it, it gives us an opportunity for the students to 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 uh, relieve stress, to go there um, hopefully early in the morning, to stay a little bit longer. Gives our staff. We have two showers in there, and one of them is totally wheelchair accessible, so that's very important. And the kinds of activities, as I understand it are uh, both on, on the machines and the weights and everything. And there's also um, basic, basically yoga. And, uh, and uh, they, have, they have a little ping pong table or um, table tennis. They, they can fold it up and open it up and people can, can get involved. In the month of January, we had a lot of people for the New Year's resolutions. They are like, New Year's, New Me. So I've, I've actually, uh, people who told, talked to me about it, like I've actually been seeing them a lot. So it's like, it's actually their New Year's resolutions actually coming along. I see them every once in a while, maybe like once or twice a week. But in those once or twice a week, they actually work out pretty hard. And then I get a lot of people during the afternoons. I like it when I see a new face and they say, they, I've never been here, what do I do? Because at least that way they know that, like, okay, I'm getting them more active. And then a couple of years when no one, when all the population, they don't know about Frog's Gym, more people are going to be using this facility. And I hope that way I will have a better case to get them, like, more equipment and hopefully more space anything in the future. Well, I'm afraid it's about that time that we bid you a farewell. Tune in next week to see another set of great docs produced by Centennial College students. Hope you all had a fun time and learned something on this crazy ride that we call The Journal. I'm Sam Pierce. And I'm Mike Katrowski. Thanks for watching. Extract the hair from your morning face Stuck in the mirror for what left a trace And fill it up with gasoline And getting stuck up somewhere in between Found in the corner, lost in what forest we have. Speak easy for dead dogs, have no way to try and warn us. Found in the corner, lost in what forest we have. Speak easy for dead dogs, have no way to try and warn us.